Hey guys, welcome to 2018 and what I hope is going to be another year of informative and educational content through Inside Property Investing. If you've not come across me before, my name is Mike Stenhouse, host of the Inside Property Investing podcast and I want to start off by wishing you all a very happy new year. But I hope that sufficient time has now passed since the day itself that all of the inane messages of let's get out there and smash it have subsided and we can focus on the real nitty gritty strategy of what we need to do to make 2018 an even better year in the property world than 2017. Now I've got no complaints really about 2017 from our own success point of view. We had a couple of great projects come off that we were extremely happy with and I know from watching all of your journeys as well that there have been some phenomenal successes within the IPI network that I'm extremely proud of and it has been great to watch and learn as you guys have developed and up your games as well. Now, there have been some issues with 2017 though and that is what I want to address in this video. It's not gonna be all positivity and happy clappy, let's get out there and do this in fact, I've got some real frustrations with the property industry at the moment, but I'm hoping that we can address them collectively and hopefully make this a better environment for all of us to operate in. So without further ado, this is my State of the Union for 2018 and the UK property investment industry. Bum, 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 bum. focus on what I perceive to be some of the biggest issues, not just for new investors, but also for experienced investors. And like I say, hopefully as a group with a little bit of effort, we can get rid of some of these bad habits that have snuck into what once was and still is to an extent, an amazingly collaborative and support, supportive, collaborative and supportive environment for aspiring property investors. Without doubt, one of my own biggest personal grievances with 2017 was it seemed to be the year when all of a sudden every investor became an expert. Gone were the days where people would ask genuine questions and receive genuine answers at live networking events and on the online forums and a new wave of one-upmanship and almost a pissing competition of who can give the most correct answer or prove the other person wrong in the most elaborate way was welcomed. And it was really disappointing to see because with that almost competitive, angsty nature, the number of good questions being asked reduced. And then because fewer questions were being asked, there was less opportunity for these guys to prove each other wrong. So the questions that were getting asked just descended into arguments and debates. And of course there are different ways to answer questions in the property world. There is no one size fits all approach, but that, uh, that feeling of a community really started to get tarnished. And it was a real shame to see that. And I noticed this in a couple of interactions I had with people throughout the year as well in quite a potentially damaging way. There was one instance when I was at a networking event and I was just chatting to someone and she asked me what I was up to and I said predominantly we're focusing on HMOs and without asking me about what my goals were, what my experience was, what I wanted to achieve, she just flat out told me that that was the wrong strategy to pursue and that if I wanted to be anywhere serious in property investing. I needed to focus on serviced apartments. She had no idea about me and when I quizzed her on her experience, she didn't have a single service department either to give me that advice but because she had been told this, because she had heard it somewhere else, she felt qualified to pass on that knowledge as gospel and potentially give me bad advice from my own personal circumstances just because someone told her the essay was the right thing to do. I had a similar experience as well in a group environment, so it wasn't just me receiving the bad advice, but one guy had been on a course about commercial conversions and how the ideal strategy was to get big high street chain tenants in your commercial properties and then you can retire after a couple of deals, live the dream, put your feet up and relax. And he dismissed every single strategy in the room. You're all doing it wrong. What you need to do is buy these properties, get these tenants in place, and that is the only investing strategy that makes sense going forwards. And I was just amazed that someone could be so bullshy to give that advice to a whole group of investors with different levels of experience, different amounts of cash in the bank, different requirements from their property investing. This one size fits all approach. And again, when quizzed, 
well, how many of these have you got up? How many of these big high street tenants have you got? How long have they been in situation? Is it actually working well for you? I've not done any yet, but I heard this guy on stage tell me it was a good idea, so it must be right. And I was just blown away by this. It drives me crazy to see people giving bad advice with, I wouldn't even say good intentions. Sometimes they're just wanting to hear the sound of their own voice. And I think this was illustrated perfectly towards the end of 2017 with the whole Bitcoin phenomenon. And I've spoken to people who've been investing in Bitcoin for God, years. I think Ben and Tom Thorns, who were a big feature on the podcast last year and their final interview will be coming out very soon. Tom is a really switched on. I mean, Ben's a smart guy as well, but Tom is super switched on when it comes to sort of the financial investing side of things, understanding stock market, Forex, and he's been investing in Bitcoin for close to a decade, I believe, and doing really well from it. But they're not preaching about it. It was when every second post on my Facebook stream became, you must invest in Bitcoin. It's the best way to achieve these significant returns. And absolutely, people are making a lot of money from it, but the risks are huge. And a lot of people that were preaching to invest in Bitcoin had no idea about the fundamentals behind it, behind blockchain technology. They just saw other people making money from it. There was this herd mentality. And rather than just them investing themselves, they're making the whole situation so much worse by then telling people to invest in it as if they are some sort of expert and they actually understand what's going on. And that's where the real danger comes from. So what can we do to rectify this situation? Well, my first thing would be to plead with you. If you are looking for advice, please continue to ask the questions. Go to the forums online, on Facebook, go to the networking events and do ask people because you will find diamonds in the rough and there will be people who are willing to share with you good, genuine knowledge based on their experience and track record. Don't be put off by people taking over your threads with debates and aggressive arguments, there will be some good information in there. But I think what you have to keep in mind is that these days everyone does want to be heard, everyone does want to seem as if they are an expert. So take everything you read with a pinch of salt. Get multiple opinions on something before you make any potentially costly or important decisions. And appreciate that whilst people may project a good game, everyone is just projecting the best version of themselves that they can. It's all a branding exercise at the end of the day. So understand and take heed from the fact that we've all got struggles behind closed doors. What we put out on Facebook, what we project at network meetings, isn't necessarily the whole truth. And if you're struggling, the people who you think are doing extremely well will have their own struggles that they're facing as well. So don't be disheartened by the fact that everyone all of a sudden seems like an expert. And for those of you who are giving this advice, absolutely continue to give advice, but please keep in mind, the advice that you're giving out can be potentially damaging as well as have positive impacts. It is not a good thing to give people poor advice without understanding their own situations. It may make you feel better, but the ongoing ramifications of that can be huge. So just take a second to consider the circumstances of the person asking the question and not just your own personal vendetta. So. If you are an expert in a field, keep going out there, keep sharing your knowledge with people, but do it in an honest way. Have a bit of self-awareness, understand where your strengths and weaknesses are, and think about the person who has put themselves out there and said, hey, I'm asking this question because I don't know the answer and I'd really like your help. Don't put them down for not knowing it. Not everyone is an expert. We all started somewhere and we all need the advice and support of this community to continue to progress in our own journeys. So keep that in mind and hopefully we can get over some of this notion that everyone is an expert, everyone knows more than the next person and we can go back to it being a community. Another big frustration of mine last year was this idea that we need to keep diversifying, keep taking on more projects and different strategies in order to be successful. And it comes back to what I was saying about people projecting the best version of themselves on social media. You see people working on a handful of different strategies and you think, geez, I'm not achieving the same results. I'm not achieving it as quickly as these other people. They must be doing something that I'm not. So I need to expand. I need to do more things. I need to do everything quicker. And I can assure you that although I don't know your circumstances, Depending on what you want to achieve, I'd say eight out of 10 times, nine out of 10 times, it is an absolute load of bollocks that you need to be doing more than you currently are. You do not need to be doing 27 different investment strategies. You don't even need to be doing three different investment strategies. More often than not, doing one strategy and executing it to the best of your abilities is going to give you far more success, far more results, both financially and just from a, a personal 
sense of satisfaction point of view than three different strategies that are each getting a third of your time. And again, I experienced this in my own personal life throughout 2017 trying to run the podcast, trying to run our own portfolio, trying to run a letting agency, trying to do all sorts of different things. And although our own property investing went very well, you probably have noticed that the number of interviews we released last year dropped significantly. We started a lot of things that didn't quite get finished. We launched an HMO course, which I will put my hands up and say, we didn't deliver to the best of our ability. The content is phenomenal. There's a wealth of information there. It's a bargain price. This is not a sales pitch, but It took me a hell of a lot longer to deliver it than I promised it would because I had other distractions. I had a million people looking for my time, my attention, and I just got busy. I got flustered. And whilst some weeks I was operating with 100% energy and efficiency and working 16 hour days and absolutely loving it, that took its toll on me. And other weeks I was doing very little. I was not effective. It was not a good year for me from a productivity point of view. And that's because I was overwhelmed. Now, like I say, for most of the population, if we've got modest ambitions, we want to replace an income or plan for retirement, then there's a pretty easy solution for this. We just need to chill out and not take on too much so that we get overwhelmed. There is no magic bullet, no one size fits all strategy that if you just start doing that one in addition to what you're doing, it's gonna solve all of your problems. The best thing is to focus on one specific strategy. I've said this umpteen times in the past, but one strategy executed well will deliver far better results in most cases than three three strategies executed poorly. So if you don't have vast ambitions, if you don't want to be the next Branson or Bill Gates, then just pick that strategy that you're probably already doing and focus all your attention on that cut out the distractions and you will achieve that success. But if your aspirations do stretch beyond replacing an income plan for retirement, if you want this to be a really successful business, if you want the yacht, if you want all the holidays and the fancy cars and everything, then yeah, you probably will have to diversify a little bit and work that little bit harder. But even then, I think there is a solution. I spend a lot of time reading and obviously listening to audio books as well. And some of my favorite books from the last 12 months have been biographies of some of my favorite entrepreneurs guys like Jeff Bezos at Amazon, Tony Shea at Zappos, which later sold out to Amazon, just finished Elon Musk's biography about his growth of Tesla, SpaceX, and Solar City. I think it is his solar panel company, all three of which are just achieving phenomenal results. And, you know, he's a great example of someone who has got three different strategies on his plate, but is executing them all pretty well. He's had a few hiccups along the way, but doing a pretty good job. And then the Steve Jobs book that came out a couple of years ago as well. I noticed similar themes and recurring success traits in all of these people that I'm gonna try and apply to my life and have been doing for the past month or two and already seem to be having a lot of positive results as as a result of that, positive benefits as a result of that. The first thing they all seem to do is to grow their businesses extremely quickly. Bezos pretty much wiped out the modern high street as we know it in the space of a decade. Elon Musk has completely reinvigorated the space exploration industry with SpaceX and taken something where no real progress had been made for decades and brought a whole new industry to it where there are actual financially profitable ramifications of getting into space, which was just written off since what the 60s or 70s. He has brought life back into it and now you've got a whole new space race with Branson and Bezos getting involved in that as well. They do not set out to start companies with modest goals. Modest goals result in modest results. I'm using results a lot today, but I don't know, maybe it's topical. So you need to set these lofty aspirations. Do not be afraid to set goals and set yourself targets for what you want your business to become. If all you do is set yourself these little piddly incremental check marks, then all you're ever gonna achieve is incremental results. Now, there is no way that you're gonna be able to achieve this on your own, and that is something else that I have learned last year, trying to do everything myself, trying to record and edit podcasts, record and edit videos, trying to secure property deals, secure finance, even getting my hands dirty and doing some of the work myself on site. It just wasn't long-term sustainable. It wasn't viable to grow any of the businesses that I wanted to, as big as I wanted to, if I was trying to do everything myself. And I'll put my hands up and say, I'm a bit of a micromanager. I like to be involved. I like to be in control. I'm probably a bit of a control freak as well, although don't ask Victoria because she'll verify that and you know, then we'll all get a little bit embarrassed. So. If you want to grow these businesses, you need to get a team of people around you. And similar to how they grow 
their businesses with massive aspirations and massive ambitions. They grow their businesses by surrounding themselves with a really strong team of people really early on. And then they step back and they let these people, these employees, these co-founders, whatever you want to call them, however you want to structure your business, they let them go out there and have their own successes. And yes, people will say people like Steve Jobs were hideous micromanagers that liked to be involved in every detail and had little temper tantrums if something wasn't done to their exacting standards. You can absolutely have high standards, but he wasn't trying to do every task himself. Yes, he had regular review meetings, and yes, he held people to these high standards that he set for himself, but he did, to an extent, get out of the way. He set the vision, he brought people in. He wasn't in the factory stamping out the aluminium for the cases for his MacBooks. He knew what his strengths were, and he brought people in to fill in the gaps, and that is something that we are starting to do now. We've taken on a project manager in the property business who's responsible for all of the scheduling, the budgeting, making sure that all of our trades are happy and working together and know what they are working towards, and that has allowed us to deliver our projects a lot quicker. He's been with us about six months now, and already we are seeing the results of that. And yes, it cost us a little bit of money in the short run, but as a result of that, like I say, we're delivering projects quicker, so we're getting the profit in quicker and we're also able to take on more projects so that ties back into our goals of scaling up which I wouldn't have been able to do without his help. Similarly in the IPI side of things we're taking on an editor as a business partner who has come from the media industry. He has got a wealth of experience in growing media companies from little brands right up to some of the best known brands in the world. And he is excited to get on board with us because he's got a real passion for property, but knowledge in the media side of things. And equally, I've got a passion for media, but knowledge and property. And together, hopefully we can transform IPI into a real powerhouse of property investment, knowledge and content. So again, I'm using my strengths, I'm finding people with complementary strengths, and by working together, this one remains to be seen, but I'm pretty sure we'll have the same results as we saw in the property business. One of the most disappointing elements of the last 12 months was the, frankly, verging on evil uses of social media and the internet more widely. Some of these were, you know, on the face of it, seemingly pretty harmless, but stupid little things like people using Facebook to ask these inane questions in order to get engagement so that when they start posting promotional content for something that they want to sell, they get more views and more likes on that. It's just, uh, it's preying on the naive, the lonely, and people who just don't know better. So if you see these questions, I think someone must have run a course on it. These questions, you know, what is your favorite car? What are you, like just absolute crap don't respond to it because the more you respond to it, the more they think it's working and the whole cycle just perpetuates. But worse than that was this whole scandal around uh, property tribes, Vanessa Warwick and the group of people that were really going out and targeting other property investors to ruin their reputations. Now, I want to say here that I think that group did a lot of good. They brought to justice a lot of people who were causing a lot of damage both financially and mentally to you know people who just wanted to get ahead in life by investing with someone that they trusted in and Vanessa Warwick through her property tribes platform or the property tribes platform that she comments on frequently I believe there's some sort of legal question there around the fact that Vanessa doesn't actually have any ownership in property tribes so disclaimer alert blah 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 Whatever the situation is, that group of people have brought to the awareness of the masses that a lot of people, or several people certainly, have done wrong and deserve to be named and shamed. What they then did, for some unknown reason, probably related to ego, was they started attacking random individuals who were just trying to grow a business. And the whole thing disintegrated. There was this private group there was a whole bunch of malicious, evil, personal posts about people that had nothing to do with their business in a lot of cases. It was just, I don't like this person, let's make fun of them, and then let's go and attack them in the public domain so that we can discredit them and ruin their business. That is a horrific thing to do 
full stop. There is no excuse for that. It is a real shame because on the back of that, some of the people who genuinely deserve to have their reputation ruined came back and said, oh yes, I was part of this as well. I was victimized and look, they were horrible to this person saying that she looked like a man or whatever else. So the fact that they said I stole hundreds of thousands of pounds from these investors I mean I was innocent as well, blah, blah, blah. A lot of bollocks, frankly. These people deserve to be brought to justice. They did horrific things. And thank you to that group for bringing those injustices to the public attention. Why they had to go and ruin it then by being petty, I've got no idea. But then on the back of that, it gets worse. You get this second layer of people jumping on the bandwagon and trying to make a name for themselves by fighting back against it and building their whole brand around, oh, well, we're the ones that are sticking up for the people who were originally sticking up for our property investors. And the whole thing just got messy. There's a whole element of just lacking in self-awareness and just ego and horrible things that just really shouldn't have happened in the first place anyway. So. For everyone that was involved in that, they really need to figure out what they're gonna to do to make amends because it was pretty horrible and I was really surprised by some of the people in that. So with social media, again, you know, it can be a vicious place. Let's just go back to trying to help each other out, posting nice aspirational posts, letting people know that it's not always sunshine and rainbows. Let's share some of the difficulties that we face as well. So the people who aren't as prolific in putting their own content out there can see that, yeah, we have struggles, we have difficulties, we have challenges, as well as the successes that we like to share. And I'm holding my hands up now and saying to all of you people who aren't prolific on Facebook can just sit and watch and take it in versus post your own because you don't have the same ego issue that me and everyone else does who needs to post all this stuff about ourselves has. We do have issues, we do face challenges, we do struggle. There is a lot going on behind the scenes that you don't see. So when you're having these challenges and struggles and difficulties, you're in the same boat as the rest of us. So don't feel bad about it. This is a tough industry. Things go wrong all the time. It's all about how resilient we can be. We need to bounce back. And if you are struggling, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll do what I can to help you out. But just keep in mind that what you see on social media is one very small part of the world. Do not let it impact you in too big a way. And for those people that were involved in it, like I say, hopefully you've learned your lesson. Don't be stupid. Don't be an arsehole. And hopefully we can all move on from all of this. As I get to my fourth and final frustration of the year, I'm starting to realize that these are all actually pretty well related. This one is down to the people who are bringing in new customers and new clients by being downright dishonest about their previous successes, the amount of business that they've done, what they're good at, what their strengths are. And again, it's about projecting this image that is not entirely true or in a lot of cases is just an absolute lie. There are bad property sourcers, bad project managers, bad basically any fill in the blank in the property industry that are still getting hundreds of clients every month, every week, every year, depending on how their businesses operate, depending on how aggressive they are, when their businesses are fundamentally flawed. They are doing things in drastically wrong ways. They're not compliant with the necessary legislation. They're giving terrible customer service. They are running over budget and over schedule on projects. They've got no experience or track record of their own, so to speak but because they can present things in the right way, because they can brand themselves and market themselves, they're drawing people in. And it's horrible to think that these people are taking advantage of others, but it really comes back to us having to do due diligence and really understand the people that we're looking to work with and looking to get into business with. Now, a couple examples that I've had personal experience with over the past 12 months, property, sourcers and property managers, project managers, offering deals out there that really just don't make sense. Getting them through conveyancing and then turning around and saying, actually, we underestimated your refurb costs by 70%. This isn't like 10 or 20 grand. This is like over a hundred thousand pounds of undervalued costs because they muffed up their, their budgeting criteria when they're looking at the project. And it's not them that's impacted by that, it's the investor that is now tied into the deal, has completed on it. Equally, you've got project managers who are saying that they've completed dozens of deals, hundreds of deals, and they're raising funds now for their next ones, or they're looking for investors to offer a sourcing and project management service too. And again, from first-hand experience, from seeing some of these properties, because people have contacted me and said, come and look at this, is this really the standard it should be finished to? These are the clients coming to me and saying this. 
the projects are terrible. They're not compliant. They don't have their, this was an HMO, well, a number of HMOs that we went to see. They weren't compliant with HMO licensing regulations, fire safety regulations, a whole host of things were wrong with them. Things started falling apart straight away. But yet, these people aren't coming forwards. So the people who are looking for the business, the sourcers and the project managers can get away with it because people are scared to speak out or they're just so fed up with the situation that they can't be bothered to do it. Similarly, we were looking for an accountant earlier this year. I said that we weren't happy with the one that you've been using. He then came after me on social media saying, oh, it was your fault, we couldn't schedule time with you, blah, blah, blah. And I must've got 30, 40, 50 messages to me on Facebook saying, well, actually, I had the same issue with this guy. He wasn't good to me. He could never find time for me. He got me signed up and then didn't follow through on his promises, a whole bunch of other stuff. So there's a lot of frustration out there, but it's not getting vented. And I'm not suggesting we all need to start naming and shaming and bitching about people because of that negativity. Just, oh, it's just a self-fulfilling cycle. It gets horrible and messy, and that's not what I want. But if you're looking to work with anyone in any element of your business, whether it's sourcing deals, project managing your deals, accountancy services, legal services, planning consultants, often the ones who shout loudest are the ones that need to be shouting loudest to get the business because if you look under the covers, the businesses aren't actually that strong. So just take a breath, don't be drawn in by the shiny magazines and the glossy marketing materials. Ask around people who have actually spoken to them, speak to previous clients, existing clients, get referrals, get testimonials, get lots of different opinions, speak to lots of different people, figure out what is important to you and come up with an interview schedule for everyone that you want to be working with and take time to make these decisions because whether it's a sourcer that's gonna buy you a deal or an accountant that you're gonna be working with for years to come, these are long-term and potentially very costly decisions for you. Some of the biggest decisions that you will make in your life. So just take a breath, don't rush into these things and hopefully as a result of doing a little bit more homework, a little bit more research, speaking to a few more people and having a bit more time to digest all of the information and make a sound decision, it will pay off dividends in the long run. That's enough negativity though. I know I'm a real crank, but I promise you it comes from a place of warmth and positivity. I would far rather that we were all succeeding together than the bitching, the backstabbing, and the preying on the inexperience that I saw over the past 12 months. So let's make 2018 an amazing year, and let's focus now on what positive things we've got coming up over the next 12 months. I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't start off by discussing our HMO plans for 2018. And as it stands, we have 22 rooms either in progress or offer accepted on. That's across four different properties. So we've got six beds coming online in the very near future, end of February, early March at our Chestergate project. We've got an offer accepted on a larger eight bedroom commercial to residential conversion and we've got two smaller four bed HMOs in the pipeline as well. One, a traditional mid terrace house that we're gonna split from a three bed into a four bed, and then another which is gonna be an apartment on top of one of the buildings that we are converting. So lots of exciting projects on the HMO front. Each of those rooms will generate us between 200 to 250 pounds per month profit and across those 22 different rooms, that's about four and a half to five and a half grand getting added to our profit from those rooms over the next 12 months. Although keep in mind that some of those are joint ventures, so an investor will be taking 50% of that. Now, we may continue to look for other HMOs and certainly if the right deal presents itself to us, we will pursue that, but it's not something we're gonna go out there and aggressively pursue. There's a couple of reasons for this. The market is getting a little bit more competitive and whilst this isn't enough to put, it, put us off in its own right, we're also looking to diversify our portfolio a little bit coming over the next 12 months as well. We have been investing heavily in HMOs for the past couple of years and we feel like now is the time to move on to new ideas and new sources of income. So there will be a focus on single lets. We may even look at a couple of serviced apartments and certainly there will be a few projects in there on either a build to sell or a buy to sell basis to increase our cash pot and build up some of the reserves that will be depleted from these HMO investments. So, so far, I think we've got 10 apartments, 10 single let apartments lined up. We own a plot of land that we've got planning permission on for five apartments and a ground floor, uh, ground floor commercial space, which we may even choose to move into ourselves. Then we have got two different commercial conversions 
one which is going to have four apartments in it so that brings us up to nine and then the other is going to be an apartment underneath the HMO that I was just talking about so that's just one apartment there really it's two apartments in that building but one of them will be a four bed mini HMO so that brings us up to ten apartments in the pipeline and that is all before we even really get started in 2018 so hopefully there will be a couple more projects lined up plenty of profit potential out there for us plenty to keep us busy plenty to keep our project manager busy and a bit of a plug here if you're looking to invest in property and are looking at these types of projects commercial to residential conversions larger HMO projects and you want to have a chat to us about potential investment opportunities and what they look like feel free to get in touch we are definitely open for business when it comes to raising funds buying property is an expensive game as I'm sure you know but because we are making phenomenal profits on a lot of these projects we can also offer our investors phenomenal returns as well so give us a shout if that's something that interests you and finally we also have big plans for for the podcast and I know I say this all the time and then I disappoint you because I get busy with other projects I get sidetracked and the episodes don't come out as frequently as I'd like the video content isn't as polished as I would like but we are trying our best and as I said earlier we're also trying to lure one of the best editors in the media world to us to work with us alongside us to help us grow the IPI brand and fingers crossed summer 2018 he should be fully on board it and you should notice a big difference in the quality the consistency of content that we are putting out there so part of our plan is to share your success stories throughout 2018 we've got a lot of case studies lined up we're on site in the next couple of days visiting lots of different projects that we're going to be doing interviews on we're going to be doing video case studies video tours we'll be documenting a hell of a lot of success stories throughout the property industry and the challenges that people are facing as well so that we can learn from the mistakes that other people have made and hopefully avoid those mistakes as well. But it's an exciting year. Like I say, I've had enough negativity. I needed a good rant about 2017, but I've got a good feeling about 2018. I hope you guys do too. And I'm extremely excited for all of us and what we can achieve over the next 12 months. To wrap us up then, if you are watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, then please remember that our podcast is where the bulk of our content is currently published. So check that out on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you want, where all of our interviews with inspiring and successful property investors will be released. If you're listening to this on the podcast, then head over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel there because as you know, property is such a visual thing. And whilst it is great to listen to these interviews, it is so much better to see inside the projects that people are talking about as well. We've got a lot of video content lined up for 2018. We've already got a lot of video content on our channel over there as well. So head over to YouTube find Inside Property Investing, subscribe to our channel and keep up to date with that. Also, just one last time, I want to put a 